Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 67 and just a few short bits of channel admin this time round. First of all to say uh, thank you very much to everybody who sent me emails regarding the upcoming trip to the USA. Um, I'm not ignoring them, it's purely that I want to make sure absolutely everything is squared away uh, tickets wise etc before I start sending out dates and times and things that might otherwise prove to be erroneous but I should have all of that sorted within the next well by the time this uploads by the next within about a week or so so hopefully towards the end of next week and big or the beginning of the week after that you should start see start start seeing replies coming in um and i must say thank you very much for the generosity shown by a great number of you so hopefully we shall be talking soon about that and the only other thing is to announce the parameters of the last ship design competition for the year. So similar rules to last time, except that the target design this time around is a Dreadnought era, specifically a 1904 era armoured cruiser. So your limitations in this case are a maximum gun calibre size of 10 inches, a maximum displacement of 15,000 tonnes, and of course, you must use vertical triple expansion engines. Outside of that, uh, the only other restriction is basically, well, it's got to be roughly in keeping with armoured cruiser design of the period, so no dreadnought style layouts, I'm afraid. But there's a wide variety of other layouts for you to look at and adopt. So that competition will run... From now, and due to obviously the end of the year, I think we will make the closing date the end of the first week in 2020. So that will be Sunday the 5th of January. So have fun with that one. And we should hopefully have the winners of the last competition announced relatively soon. And the questions this week are taken from the videos on the French pre-dreadnought Messina, and the special on the battle for Flamborough Head. Bird Dog asks, uh, he says, To a layman like me, the drawbacks of the tumble home design appear to be quite obvious. But in reality, how bad was the design in terms of both stability and reduced internal volume relative to surface area, and what was the reasoning behind the choice of this type of design? So the two primary advantages to tumble home design, which was really most of what the French designs were aiming at, and to an extent the people who copied them when it came to the Brew Dreadnought era, were that by making your upper decks progressively narrower and narrower, you reduced the amount of weight that was high up on the ship, which, given that you're still in an era of compound and early steel armours, so considerable amounts of metal and of course primary secondary tertiary quaternary etc batteries there's an awful lot of weight that's going into pre-dreadnoughts quite high up in the ship so the less of that the less weight you can have high up in the ship the better and so by narrowing the ship's hull structure obviously there is uh, less physical structure higher up which um, means that in theory the weight is better distributed the other thing is in terms of absolute seaworthiness and field of fire for your guns. And that's because by reducing the total amount of weight a certain distance above the water, you can in theory take the hull higher above the water. And that's one of the things you'll notice if you compare some of the French and French designed ships with Extreme Tumble Home to their contemporaries from other nations in terms of the pre-dreadnought era at least, you'll notice the hulls of the Tumblehome ships are often significantly higher above the water, all told. Now this has uh, two factors. One obviously means that your guns are physically higher above the water, which gives them a slightly greater field of view and a better field of fire. But secondly, it also means that because your bow particularly, 
is higher, it means that you get less water over the bow in lower sea states, and that makes your ship more seaworthy. Now, those two factors combined do actually make for a ship that, during peacetime, can transit in weather that perhaps others will struggle in. The uh, Second Pacific Squadron, for example, with its four most modern ships being French-derived Borodino-type battleships, actually survived a heck of a beating off of the west coast of Africa with, uh, as alluded to in the video on that particular voyage, um, at one point the storms being so bad that people on the aft deck of the Russian flagship could look backwards and see the in pretty much the entirety of the following battleship several dozen feet above them on the waves. That's pretty bad weather, but as it turns out, a unbreached tumble home style design, which obviously has the vast majority of its structure and mass fairly low down and is therefore relatively stable, is actually pretty good at making its way through this kind of weather. Now, the other thing you've got to realise is that although scientific ship design was obviously a thing at this point, some of the finer arts that we today might take for granted in terms of designing various aspects of the ship were not fully developed, if at all. Uh, stuff like uh, Froud's water test tanks for hydrodynamic form were still pretty new at the time, and the kind of complex calculations for stability that are kind of taken as part of the course today were definitely not taken as part of the course at the time. Of course, stability was known about, and calculations to work out stability did exist, but when you've got to do that entire set of calculations by hand, you obviously are not going to do quite as thorough and complete a job in a given amount of time as you could these days. And laser focusing in even more, whilst it was possible, and indeed they did calculate things like the metacentric height and the angle of stability, for a ship as designed, trying to work out the multiple different scenarios where you had to run all those calculations again for various flooding scenarios, i.e. if you've taken damage um, and the ship has started to list and you've got weight in places where there really shouldn't be weight, this kind of stuff is, there's a limit to what you can do. And so the designers didn't quite fully appreciate how badly compromised stability could be once ships started to go a little bit off kilter. This, as it turned out, would actually be the primary weakness of the tumble home design. Um, there are obviously quite a few others, but the main one was the fact that once the ships started to flood and started to list, then all of a sudden the centre of balance changed quite dramatically and they became very unstable very quickly and the ships could keel over and capsize very, very rapidly and unexpectedly as indeed did happen to a number of Russian ships at Tsushima and a number of French ships in World War One. And in very crude but brief terms, the reason for this is... it. If you imagine a traditional pre-dreadnought battleship starting to list to port or starboard, obviously one of the main things that's changing in terms of overall ship's mass is quite where the uh, centre of gravity for the main gun turrets are. I mean, there's lots of other heavy stuff up there, but the main gun turrets are the easiest thing to visualise. Now, if you are on a more traditional ship where the hull is effectively vertical, then as the ship heals over, there's still a fair bit of the hull, which hopefully isn't flooded, um, and therefore is buoyant, that is away from the turret, is further out, and that obviously with buoyancy is pushing the ship up, and due to what you might commonly call lever action or the law of moments, it's resisting the fact that now that the gun turrets are off, uh, off the true centre of the ship, they're trying to pull the ship over, but this buoyancy factor is trying to push the ship back up again. Whereas with a tumble home design, that large, relatively large buoyant section at the port or starboard extremities of the ship doesn't really exist. So once the ship starts to roll, effectively there's nothing really resisting the weight of the turret, the main gun turrets and other heavy 
uh, superstructure from just pulling the ship right over in even cruder terms. I mean, I'm going down and down through the uh, varieties of ways of describing this, but if you ever happen to find yourself in a swimming pool with a couple of uh, sort of kids armband floats or small inflatable rings or something like that effectively you could say the difference would be trying to sit in the water with those effectively just sitting underneath you which is kind of the tumble home theory or having those attached to or underneath both arms and then you'll you'll get very quickly the idea that yes you might not be quite as high in the water if you're got them on or under your arms but trying to keel over is actually incredibly difficult whereas if you're effectively sitting on them so and sort of all your points basically what you're doing is you're concentrating your buoyancy more towards the center great you'll be sitting upright and happy and everything but the minute you list more than about 10 15 degrees you're not coming back very easily Josh Thomas Moore asks, Would the Japanese have been better served at Guadalcanal with their light carriers over Hiei and Kirishima, and if so, which carriers would have been available to them? The short answer is well, probably not. Um, I mean, Guadalcanal as a campaign, fair enough, it starts in the last third of 1942, so we're, I mean, we're only talking eight, nine months after the USA even enters the Second World War. And although it does see events like the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, the loss of the USS Hornet, the loss of the USS Wasp, etc., the overall course of the action, remember, it was an Allied offensive. In fact, it was the first big Allied offensive of the Pacific War, um, which put the Japanese on the back foot, bearing in mind this post-dates the Battle of Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway. And the Japanese, to a fair extent, knew and acknowledged this pretty early on. Um, when you look at the vast majority of naval actions fought during the Guadalcanal campaign, they're night actions. And that's for a very good reason. The Japanese were already beginning to realize that if they tried to enact full-scale fleet operations in and around Guadalcanal during the day that was a very, very good chance of being caught out by the Allied forces. I mean, obviously, mostly Americans at this point, um, but there were others there available as well. Now, when it comes to the use of Hiei and Kirishima, I mean, Kirishima lucked out in some ways very well and very badly at the same time, in as much as it ran across the South Dakota, which was incredibly bad luck on paper, then South Dakota... Um, managed to completely short-circuit itself, which was very good luck for Kirishima, and then USS Washington showed up out of nowhere, which was even worse luck for Kirishima. Um, but, all things told, for the purposes of what the Japanese were trying to accomplish at Guadalcanal, Hiei and Kirishima were far more useful to those objectives of supporting their troops and trying to disrupt American landings and destroy um, various American facilities than a few light carriers would have been, because at that point, nighttime operations not really something that the Japanese light carriers are particularly experienced at doing, which would mean that attacks would have to occur during the day. If the attacks occurring during the day, then you've got one of two choices. Well, either you can try and exploit the relatively decent range um, to going all the way up to excellent range of Japanese carrier-based aircraft and launch strikes from far away, at which point you're making daylight attacks with relatively small air groups against Allied air power, which is just an easy way to lose pilots, or you can try and sail closer and maybe get some more heavily loaded quick punches in. But in either case, you're exposing your ships quite badly, and the Allied air power and air defences are quite likely to make you pay quite heavily for that. So, looking at the situation on paper as you go into it, a couple of upgraded battle cruisers actually offer you significantly more punch and a lot more ability to operate during the night. The fact that, especially the captain of Hiei, decided the best thing to do would be to take said lightly armoured upgraded battle cruiser into a knife fight. Uh, engagement with a bunch of American cruisers that at that range could quite happily punch through most of its protection is a somewhat different matter. 
but that is the difference between plans on paper and plans in execution. Adam Ladd asks, You mentioned in a previous video that the idea to run a pre-dreadnought aground at Gallipoli sounded good to the layman, but wasn't a practical idea in, in practice. Can you please explain why? So yes, the idea that cropped up occasionally during the campaign was this idea of running one or more obsolete pre-dreadnought battleships aground and using them as effectively fortresses from which they could engage and suppress the Ottoman guns and therefore hopefully enable the landings to succeed um, in a slightly better fashion than they actually historically did. Now, the problem with this concept, although it sounds good, because um, effectively you're, you're moving in your own fortress and the one major concern that most of the pre-dreadnoughts apparently have when you look at it initially on paper is, well, being sunk, and if you've run aground you cannot be sunk because you already are technically sunk. Um, now the issue can be illustrated actually by the ship that's pictured, which is HMS Albion, uh, which was a pre-dreadnought of the Canopus class that was involved in quite a number of support operations in the Dardanelles. At one point, as pictured here, she did actually go aground, and the Ottoman forces um, focused in on her, and <laughs> she had to try and unstick herself by various methods, including ships coming up and towing her, whilst simultaneously working with the ship firing full broadsides to try and give it that little bit of extra impetus along with the engines and the tow to get off the sandbank that it had struck. Now, it worked, but the ship was stuck fast for quite a few hours, and it was, as I said, targeted by numerous Ottoman batteries, but to not a tremendous amount of effect. Uh, an awful lot of the shells that were being fired at it were sort of fragmentation and high explosive shells that were designed to wreak absolute havoc amongst the infantry that had landed, but against something as solidly armoured as a pre-dreadnought battleship, didn't do that much more than cut up the upper works and scratch the paint. None of the ship's vital operational systems or its armament were really affected by any of this. So you might think, well, isn't actually that proof that this would have been a good idea because it seems like it just weathered the storm and if it had run aground up near enough point blank up against the coast it would be able to zero in and destroy the enemy guns quite easily well you might think that but at the same time a little while earlier when the ship had deliberately tried to do a similar kind of stationary uh, gun battery arrangement because obviously this uh, improves the accuracy because you don't have to worry about your own ship's movement um, they had to move pretty quickly and this was because in that area the Ottomans started to deploy a similar kind of uh, attack pattern that the Japanese had used about a decade earlier at Port Arthur and that was namely bringing in heavy howitzers now the thing with howitzers is they have an extraordinarily long flight time um, compared for a give for artillery for a given range, and also they ha are relatively inaccurate when you're trying to hit a moving target, both in because the flight time is so long, but also because the ballistic arc is so high that you basically have to land a shot pretty much dead on target which in world war one artillery terms hitting something the size of a pre-dreadnought battleship is actually relatively difficult with a howitzer you're going to need a few shots and if the ship keeps moving you're basically resetting your dip, your calculations every time but when they're stationary it becomes very different at port arthur the japanese managed to take advantage of this fact to sink most of the Russian 1st Pacific Squadron simply by zeroing in their howitzers on the anchored Russian ships and at the Dardanelles they started to do the same thing to the Albion and a few other ships that were also conducting the bombardment and then the one advantage of the howitzer at this point is that because the shell's coming in from so high and so vertically it's going to smash down into and through the deck and pre-dreadnoughts were not known for their heavy deck armor because obviously they were designed for more of a horizontal gun duel and so the ship was actually at risk uh, quite quickly and they had to haul up the anchors and start sailing around to throw off the aim of the howitzers and this is basically the problem 
if they had put a pre-dreadnought or pre-dreadnoughts aground, then sure, for a short while, um, it would have been a significant problem for the Ottoman defenders. However, they would have very quickly, uh, even if it had taken a few days, repositioned some heavy howitzers, and with the ships completely unable to go anywhere, it would have simply been a matter of spotters correcting the fall of shot, and it wouldn't have been very long before heavy shells would have been punching through the deck and into things like the machinery, which, fair enough, might not be so important now the ship's ground, but there are other things down there like fuel and the magazines, which are probably things you don't want heavy shells coming into. There's also the issue of cumulative damage, uh, because individually any given shot might not do too much damage, but the damage will eventually rack up, and when you've got things like turrets on roller bearings and delicate fire control equipment, etc., if the ship's mobile and a turret gets jammed, fire control equipment gets damaged, what or whatever, you can simply sail away, fix the problem, or go back to port if the damage is too bad, fix the problem, come back again. Doesn't really compromise your ship's overall fighting power um, all that much in the long term. But if you're aground, if that gun is out, that gun is out because you can guarantee the one thing you're not going to be able to do is send out repair parties because they'll be smothering the outside with high explosive and fragmentation rounds, um, which also means getting ammunition to the ship once it runs out of its initial supply is also going to be rather an interesting exercise. So yeah, that those are some of the uh, rather major problems with that idea. Um, effectively, it would only really be practical if you could guarantee that the intervention resulting from it would cause a breakthrough of sufficient size and magnitude such that you could dislodge any ability, enemy ability to spot for how it's a fire within probably, say, half a day of your operation starting, which, let's face it, probably isn't going to happen. Loaded Loris asks, Edinburgh and Cleveland, which one is better at being a light cruiser? Now, that's a very good question. I mean, when you look at them on, on the surface, you think, OK, they're about the same dimensions. Um, the Cleveland's slightly heavier, but not by an awful lot compared to the Edinburgh, and they're both armed with uh, four triple six-inch turrets. So, indeed, which one is better at being a light cruiser? Well, there's a couple of factors to consider, um, one of which is that despite the apparent similarities, you do have to remember the town class design is a design from the early 1930s, with the first town class being laid down in 1934, whereas the Clevelands are first laid down in the 1940s. Now, that's so, fair enough, it's only a difference of six years, but there's an awful lot that can be done <laughs> in six years. Uh, I mean, uh, to put it another way, in the US Navy, that difference is the difference between the North Carolina class and the Iowa class in battleships, um, or uh, the difference between the Yorktowns and the Essexes in aircraft carriers. So um, a lot can happen in that period, is when you're talking about naval design in the 1930s, but nevertheless, let's take a basic speed protection and firepower look. So speed-wise, the Edinburghs can make just over 32 knots, and so can the Clevelands, so speed, meh, pretty much a wash. Albeit the fact that the Clevelands are slightly beamier means that the Edinburghs managed to pull that off on just over 80,000 shaft horsepower, whereas the Clevelands need 100,000 shaft horsepower to achieve a similar speed. Now, related to propulsion is endurance, um, and in that respect, the Clevelands definitely have the edge over the Edinburghs because obviously one of the major features of a light cruiser is, well, it has to cruise, it has to operate at long distances, and the Edinburghs rain, cruising range at uh, sort of the mid-teens knots is about just under two-thirds that of a Cleveland. So the Cleveland can sail a lot further, and it can also sail at that distance a little bit faster, since its cruising speed is 15 knots as opposed to 13 knots for an Edinburgh. So in that role, um, the Cleveland gets the point. So let's go over to protection. Protection-wise, the easiest ones to look at, obviously, are belt and deck armour. So in belt armour, the maximum thickness of belt armour on the Clevelands is a third to half an inch thicker, with a five-inch thick maximum thickness of belt 
as opposed to the 4.5 to 4.8 maximum thickness on the Edinburgh's. However, when it comes to deck armor, the Edinburgh's have a maximum thickness of 3 inches as opposed to the Cleveland's 2. So, armor protection wise, it's half, 6 of one, half a dozen of the other. Although, in terms of turret armor, the Cleveland's do have a, uh, something of an edge with a turret face that is uh, up to 6.5 inches thick, whereas the Edinburgh's uh, turret face doesn't go above 4.5 inches. So, potential slight uh, ad armor advantage to the Cleveland there in anything except for longer range engagements where deck armor hits are more likely. Now, obviously, bearing in mind this is all very rough comparisons. I mean, if you wanted an absolute detailed comparison of exactly where the armor is, is positioned on each ship um, and how much of the ship is protected and all this kind of stuff, that's that would be its own video at length. But anyway, in either case, we arrive at firepower. So in the firepower case, both ships, as we said, are armed with four triple six inch turrets. Now, in terms of these guns, the Cleveland's rate of fire is theoretically somewhat higher than the Edinburgh's, albeit that in actual action, uh, in battle, it turns out actually their maximum rate of fire in, was around about the same, so it's actually pretty much a wash, albeit in absolute ideal conditions, Cleveland does have the slightly higher rate of fire. Um, the turrets themselves, the Cleveland's turrets, can train and elevate faster, but as initially designed, they cannot elevate as far. Um, as designed, they have a maximum elevation of 40 degrees. Um, the towns and the Edinburgh's as well can elevate up to 60. Uh, but as I said, the, the Cleveland's guns can arrive on target um, in terms of aiming uh, somewhat faster than the Edinburgh's can. At practical battle ranges, the British gun shells arrive slightly faster because um, they start out with slightly more velocity, but as the overall shell itself is somewhat lighter, once you get up to m the upper end of middle and longer distance uh, and longer ranges for battle range for a 6-inch light gun like cruiser, the American shell retains somewhat more uh, velocity due to its heavier nature and also has slightly better armor piercing capability due to being a full AP shell as opposed to the uh, semi-armor piercing shells on the British uh, ships. However, the when the shell actually arrives, the British shell for use against armored targets has about double the bursting charge of the American shell, which means that individual impacts are going to do more damage if you're hit by a British 6-inch shell compared to an American 6-inch shell, again, assuming both shells penetrate. So, yeah, it, overall, there are advantages and disadvantages to both sides in terms of their main armament. Um, and I think it, it's going to depend to a great extent on what exactly it is you're shooting at. If you're shooting at some of the more lightly protected theoretical targets that you're going to come across, um, so say destroyers, um, most of the Japanese cruisers, um, for example, then probably the British gun is slightly better in as much as the flight time to target is going to be slightly less and it's when it hits it's going to do a little bit more damage um, which given that um, a lot of Japanese gun uh, cruiser guns were should we say not especially well protected is probably uh, the better thing but if you're going up against ironically enough <laughs> given the navies the two the two ships were ranged against if you're going up against some of the more heavily armored cruiser grade targets um, such as a few of the Japanese uh, cruisers, particularly their heavy cruisers, or um, show, let's say uh, the German heavy cruisers, the Hippers, the Cleveland is the Cleveland's gun is probably slightly better. Now, when it comes to the secondary or AA battery, both ships have twelve guns in six twin mounts, with the Cleveland carrying. Uh, the 5-inch 38 caliber gun, and the Edinburgh's in particular carrying the quick-firing 
4 inch Mark 16 gun. Now, in this case, there is a relatively clear cut winner. The 5 inch 38 is um, a superior anti aircraft and secondary anti surface weapon to the 4 inch gun. That's not to say the 4 inch gun is terrible, it's actually a fairly good gun, it's just the 5 inch 38 is really good. Um, but also, and perhaps more critically, the Cleveland's layout has two twin uh, turrets or gun mounts on either side of the ship and one fore and aft, um, which means that the total broadside of um, secondary or anti-aircraft guns is eight, whereas on the Edinburgh's there they have uh, three twin uh, gun mounts down each side for a broadside of six, and given that the air attack environment is a 3D environment, um, the forward and aft firepower for a Cleveland is at least six turret, is six guns, whereas obviously it's at, at minimum, whereas at minimum it's four for the Edinburgh. So overall, the secondary battery definitely goes to the Cleveland. And then finally, when we go down below that for other weaponry, the uh, Edinburgh carries 16 of the 40mm pom-poms as well as some machine guns. The Clevelands carry, as designed, 12 40mm Bofors and 20 20mm Orlicans. So although they have slightly fewer 40mm barrels overall, the light anti-aircraft battery again goes to the Clevelands. The one thing when it comes to non-main guns where the Edinburghs do have superiority is torpedoes, uh, because the Edinburghs carry two triple torpedo launchers, the Clevelands don't carry any. Um, so in terms of, and this is the interesting thing, because in terms of the light cruiser role as envisaged in the 1930s, which is when the towns and eventually the Edinburghs were designed, the Edinburghs actually have the advantage, because at that point, air aircraft are not seen as a tremendously great threat and the Edinburgh's anti-aircraft battery is perfectly adequate and it, as we said sort of the main gun armament is you can make your decision one way or the other but the Edinburgh's then carry considerably more firepower in the classic light cruiser role in, because they have the torpedoes and the Clevelands don't. Conversely um, the light cruiser role as envisaged during the World War II environment when there are a lot more aircraft around the Edinburgh's are clearly the superior ship for firepower because they have a lot more anti-aircraft firepower but they don't have the torpedoes which means that in some engagements they will be of something of a disadvantage and this really illustrates um, in a lot of ways the difference in their design dates and so although this has already run to about 10 minutes as i say you probably could do an entire wednesday special on this kind of comparison in a lot more detail but overall um i say in summary, I'd give the overall edge to the Cleveland, but it depends on, by how much it depends on exactly when you're talking about. Because I say, if you're talking about a period, the time period when the town class are originally designed, the margin is much, much narrower with actually at that point, the overall firepower advantage in the early to mid 1930s assuming you teleport to cleveland back in time to that point would actually go to the edinburgh in the classic light cruiser role because of those torpedoes um and then as we covered kind of propulsion the cleveland has a slight advantage in range armor kind of a wash the cleveland has a little bit of an edge in that uh, somewhat more so in the gun turret base in department but the the sheer magnitude of the torpedo firepower for the classically envisioned 1930 light cruiser role would kind of give the Edinburgh a significant kick so, um, up the rankings. So it, it'd be near enough a score draw, slight edge to the Cleveland in the early to mid 1930s, which is pretty much what you'd expect from uh, a pair of similar light cruisers where one has about a thousand tons on the other. But once you get into the World War II period, then with the advent of obviously the air threat, the Cleveland suddenly takes a significant lead because um, the relative uh, value of the anti-aircraft battery becomes considerably greater 
in that period. Um, so I say Cleveland definitely taking the edge there, uh, except in situations where it's more about the anti-surface firepower. So yeah, basically for the environment it operated in the Pacific War and for maybe um, general fleet escort duties, the Cleveland is the superior ship, but in certain niche um, environments in World War II, such as Arctic Convoy Escort, um, or even actually things like uh, the night battles around Guadalcanal, etc., you probably would be better off with a town purely because of that additional anti-surface firepower in the form of the torpedo tubes. So hopefully that answers that. Henrik Brathen asks, the Norwegians ordered the Bjorgvin class coastal defense battleships in 1912. However, they were purchased by the Royal Navy in 1914. What effect would they have had if they had been returned to Norway after the war, and specifically if they were available instead of the Eidsvold class at the First Battle of Narvik? Now, considering this question initially and looking at the ship's armaments, uh, I was thinking, well, it's not going to make too much of a difference, is it? I mean, yeah, they're slightly better. Um, they have slightly fewer secondary back guns, and looking at the First Battle of Narvik, um, Eidsvold and Norge were both sunk by torpedo, so that isn't going to really help us. And then I thought, oh, hang on a minute. What were their Royal Navy names? Of course... They became the Glatton class, and I thought, oh, HMS Glatton, I know this ship. This ship is very famous for, well, not too many reasons, but one of them is this particular photo, um, because the Royal Navy repurposed them to effectively coastal monitors, and anticipating that there would be large numbers of German submarines and destroyers, etc., operating in that environment, as you can see, um, as well as due to increased weight due to modifications, they stuck some socking great bulges on the sides of these things um, so that they could laugh off torpedoes. Now, whether or not they can laugh off World War II era torpedoes is another matter, but those massive great things stuck on either side of the ships would provide substantially better torpedo protection than... Uh, what was available on the Eidsvold class in World War II. And so actually, given the specific part of your question, what if they had been returned to Norway after the war, i.e. with these modifications, that might actually have made a difference because um, Eidsvold made it to within 300 or so yards, which when you consider that the uh, the ships were I mean okay fair enough they're coastal defence ships so they're not the world's longest vessels um, but they that you're talking about three ship lengths um, when it was hit by torpedoes and well effectively blown into and uh, similarly with the Norge later on but yeah I mean with with those e the extra defences there's every chance they might actually survive the initial torpedoing. Uh, they might still be going down, but they're not going to quite so disastrously um, sink almost immediately as the Eidsvold did historically. Which means, well, with, with Norge's situation being uh, still in harbour, probably means they land a few hits on the German destroyers, do some damage and then go down. But Eidsvold in particular might actually succeed in ramming and taking out a German destroyer. Overall, it's not going to change the outcome of the battle itself the Germans are still going to win it um, given the number of ships they've got there but they're probably going to come away short a destroyer or two and several more damaged which would be a, definitely a slap in the face for the Kriegsmarine um, that early in the war. 4L3KS asks why was Der Flinger so tough? Ah yes, the good old Iron Dog. So the reasons for its apparent toughness in terms of taking damage um, are many and varied, actually. Um, some of them are simply slightly more subtle, but things we might not otherwise realise. Um, some of them are situational, and some of them are based on design. Now, the, in terms of things you might not actually realise, is that well, one of the reasons the Deerflingers were so good at absorbing damage, or well, Lutzow aside, perhaps, um, but... Der Flinger especially, it was actually the largest ship, along with Lutzow, present um, on the German side at Jutland. And you might think, well, hang on a minute, it's a battlecruiser. Well, yes, that's kind of the point. At this point, battlecruisers were substantial vessels. Uh, fully loaded, the Der Flingers are 
about 3,000 tons heavier than the Koenigs, which were the biggest German battleships present, and they're over 100 feet longer. So there's just more ship to to absorb uh, absorb the hits. So and I mean they're they're only half a meter narrower, so they're not even particularly slimmer. So there's an awful lot more volume for them to absorb fire than well literally any other German ship present. They're also pretty well protected. Um, German armor protection on their battle cruisers is sometimes a little bit overblown, but in the Derflingers case, eh, not so much. The Derflingers did actually carry armor on a scale of some of the earlier pre- uh, Dreadnought battleships present, so they were definitely very well protected. There was also the situational fact that the British shells due to a number of design faults, particularly around the explosives, um, had this habit of detonating pretty much on contact rather than doing their job of actually penetrating into the ship before exploding, um, which meant that not entirely, but to a certain degree, some of the armor-piercing shells were functioning more like um, high-mass, low-charge HE shells, which kind of helped. Um so yeah, malfunctioning shells on the British side certainly gave the Germans a little bit more of a survivability edge, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the Derflinger design was generally pretty darn solid. Um, they were highly sub- subdivided, um, very tough, tough built, uh, toughly built. I mean, obviously, uh, Tiger of uh, roughly contemporary era also took quite a beating and stayed intact. Um, but yeah, generally they were. They they were pretty well built, well designed ships for a fight. With one of the few exceptions being a rather significant vulnerability in having a large torpedo flat area um, near the bow of the ship, and that is ultimately what did Lutzow in uh, a couple of shells from Invincible. Ultimately, killed the ship through flooding of that large area. So yeah. Um, Basically, if you wanted to sum it up in a very few words, the reason that Defling was so tough was, one, it was a very well-designed ship and could withstand a lot of punishment, assuming that it didn't take um, a critical hit in one or, in its one or two uh, vulnerable points, as Lutzow did. Um, two, it was just a very large ship for the period, and so it had the volume to absorb a fair bit of punishment. And three, it, as we said... Um, the British shells at Jutland were not really performing as they were designed to, and so that had something of an effect on keeping the ship afloat as well. And so we're on to the Patreon questions for the last 20 minutes or so. Vinve asks, So, Henry Grass Adieu versus Great Michael, who would have come out on top? Uh, and in any case, how, difference were, how different were the Royal Scots Navy and the Royal Navy in the 16th century? Was there a chance for the Royal Scots Navy to take on the Royal Navy? So I must admit, actually, when I saw this question, my eyes lit up a bit because it's not every day that people are even aware that these ships existed, let alone ask questions about them. So uh, for everybody else... Um, the Henry Gras Adieu, or in English, Henry, thanks be to God. I mean, let's face it, he wasn't exactly one with a small ego. Um, was uh, the flagship of Henry VIII's uh, fleet, the Royal Navy, at the time. Um, it's perhaps the, the lesser known contemporary of the Mary Rose, even though it was um, larger still than that, than that vessel. The Great Michael, which is the ship on the right of this uh, two pick two ship image, um, was similarly the flagship of Scotland, and this it was all from a period when it was seen as very much uh, par for the course for the great rulers of Europe to not only have a navy uh, of some description, but also to have a really big ship um, as their overall flagship. Um, which, uh, yeah, it, it led to something of an arms race, unsurprisingly. And in fact, the Henry Grasse Adieu was pretty much designed, built and launched as a response to the building of the Great Michael, um, which was already 
a fairly substantial ship. Uh, I mean, you're talking in a, a period where ocean, serious ocean-going shipping um, could be quoted as having displacements in the tens of tons. Um, and large ships would have displacements in the low to mid hundreds of tons. Um, I mean, not too long before Columbus had sailed to America in a ships whose in three ships whose combined displacement was less than one of these vessels. Uh, that that gives you some idea of just how big these things were. I mean, even the Mary Rose displaced only about half of what these two did. I mean, to give you some idea of just what kind of scale these ships represented, you might be thinking, oh, well, they're the Yamatos of their period. Not quite. In terms of sheer size and firepower, these ships are more like introducing the Yamatos to the World War I era navies. But in terms of who would come out on top, um, that one's actually a relatively easy one. At the end of the day... The Great Michael was built first, and as we said, the Henry Grassadier was built in response, and English shipbuilding was just a bit better than Scottish shipbuilding at the time. I mean, Scotland didn't have a tremendously large fleet of ships of any significant displacement, and these were very much um, kind of the first really massive carrack uh, type ships that were built. So even if you look at it in pure uh, armament terms, I mean, the, the Henry Grasse Adieu displaces a little bit more than um, the Great Michael, and it, it's significantly more heavily armed. So it, the Gra Henry Grasse Adieu carries 43 cannon, um, roughly speaking, um, whereas in terms of large guns, the Great Michael only carries 24, so it's almost out almost outgunned two to one. Um, and then the Great Michael has around three dozen smaller guns. Um, Henry Grasadieu is a little bit ridiculous in that its smaller swivel gun sets of anti-personnel weapons run well over a hundred. Um, yeah, that's that, that's um, that, that's quite a bit. I mean, it's 151 guns total of varying size, albeit that a lot of them are the the, the swivel guns. Um, although in terms of the absolute largest guns, the the massive bronze guns that were sort of the the ultimate weapon of the period at at sea. Um, there's relatively few of those on on either ship. So, yeah. Um, I mean, you're talking about ships of just over a thousand tons that are carrying a thousand plus sailors, <laughs> and as you can see with the absolutely ridiculous. Um, upper works the the uh, four four and after castles um they're very much designed for boarding actions or bit this the guns are there mainly to support the boarding actions although they have some of the uh the heavy guns available for longer range engagements as well so yes overall um to answer that first part of the question henry grass edia goes in with a advantage in firepower um both at long range and at sh short range um in that kind of environment who the heck knows what could have happened it's uh it's very much a, a an open question although as i say the english ship has an advantage going in but in terms of the second part of the question how different were the royal scots and royal navies in the 16th century the royal scottish navy was a mixture of a prestige force to sort of make the king look better and for local defence. They had ambitions to go and help out in the Mediterranean and such, which was originally the role that the Great Michael was built for. Um, but by and large, out, outside of these these random flights of fancy, that it was pretty much, as I say, to show off and to guard the Scottish coasts. It was also substantially smaller than the Royal Navy, which at the time ranged between about 50 and 80 ships strong. That's not exactly too surprising, considering that England had a considerably larger merchant marine and a much stronger economy based partly on that merchant marine, partly on positioning, and partly on the fact that, well, it had a substantially larger population, as it indeed continues to do, uh, and therefore could generate more wealth. 
Um, I mean, it's kind of typified in as much as the Great Michael, after about 20, 15, 20 years in service, was sold off to the French because the Scots couldn't afford to maintain it. Um, whereas the Henry Grasse Adieu, despite being a significantly larger ship, even after refits, um, was around for about 40 or so years. Um, and was although it was expensive to run, it was never a question of uh, of the Royal Navy giving it up. Um, it was always going to be kept in service, and then it eventually just was too old. Um, whether or not it rotted out or got set on fire, um, no one's quite sure. TC Green asks, if rocket-missile technology had not been developed as early as it was, let's say 20 years later rather than in reality, how would that have changed warship design and strategy in the decades directly preceding the end of World War II, such as maybe reduction in primary weapons batteries in favour of more AA, changes to armour protection and things like that? Now that's an interesting one. Um, if rocket and missile tech was set back by say 20 years so what the first practical rockets are then being demonstrated in what, the 1950s um and then rocket powered mi uh, missile tech is coming around in the late 50s early 60s in its more primitive forms that might actually change things quite substantially uh, I don't think it's going to reduce the primary weapons batteries per se, although it probably means battleships will continue um, in service. And then, yeah, and then and I suppose their successors might see an, a relative reduction in weapons batteries, as in you might see a retention of the kind of nine uh, guns in three triple turrets as opposed to... A Montana style uh, 12 gun, 4 turret layout, even though you might then be seeing ships as large or larger than Montana. Now, the reason I say that is because, although obviously aircraft, uh, carrier aircraft had taken a substantial uh, lead over um, battleships and such like by the mid to late World War II period. As you might have guessed from the picture of USS Worcester, which is uh, wandering around in the screen, um, the anti-aircraft capabilities of warships had actually taken a significant step up towards the end of the war, to the point that it could potentially have redressed the balance uh, somewhat between aircraft and battleships. Now, that's not to say the aircraft carrier would have been made to go away, because... Um, as has been pointed out previously, the real reason that battleships were, comp were completely obsoleted by carriers was the fact that carriers could hit things a lot further away. Carriers were in fact a lot more vulnerable to damage than battleships were, but they could deliver a payload out a, a heck of a lot further than a battleship could. So, but when it comes to, to defending itself, I mean, you look at the various weapons that were being developed towards the end of World War II, um, in response partly to greater anti-aircraft firepower. You had things like uh, the German Henschel uh, guided missile and the Fritz X guided bomb and various allied efforts to produce similar things. But these all rely on rocket power um, and missile technology, broadly speaking, uh, with the exception of the Fritz X. But the thing is, the Fritz X being a guided bomb... Um, could be jammed, the guidance system, and the missile jammers were actually in evidence uh, even in the late World War II period. Various Allied ships were sailing with them, uh, specifically in response to the threat posed by Fritz X, um, as shown off of Italy in 1943. So... I don't think the era of the close-range guided glide bomb like a Fritz X would have lasted that long, because ultimately, at the end of the day, if you put some jammers on a ship, a ship can generate an awful lot of power, and that's going to usually be a lot more than is necessary to jam uh, the relatively primitive guidance systems that were available to at the time. 
And that leaves, um, if you take away the sort of the ro say the rocket missile powered um, parts, that effectively leaves you at the 1940s and 1950s with bombs and torpedoes. Now, aerial drop torpedoes do require you to close in to a relatively close range and sort of fly straight, level, and slow which was already proving somewhat difficult against the more competent anti-aircraft defences. And although bombs and dive bombs could be delivered slightly faster and from higher altitudes, um, there were still vulnerabilities associated with that. So at the end of the war, this is why uh, right at the end of World War II, the 5.25 inch on the Royal Navy Navy's capital ships, once the various issues with it had been fixed, was actually proving quite lethal as a long-range sniper unit with radar <laughs> radar guidance. And this is the thing, at the, the end of the war, there was an awful lot of radar guidance and highly advanced fire control equipment available. Um, the 20mm Orlikans were basically being phased out, and you had large batteries of radar-guided 40mm uh, in. You had obviously the 5-inch 38s and the 5.25-inch um in the Allied warships for heavier AA, but you were also seeing the advent of even faster, even more rapid firing um, AA capable six inch guns, as per the Worcester and eventually the Tiger class, um, and also a series of very lethal rapid fire uh, three inch anti aircraft guns, which were actually beginning to supplant even the 40 millimeter Bofors because aircraft were getting faster and uh, longer range. So, uh, long a more accurate long range anti aircraft gun was needed, and this rapid fire three inch appeared to offer the solution necessary. So, yeah, if you'd been left in a situation where aircraft, even jet aircraft, were forced to come in and try and drop torpedoes or loft regular bombs you could have seen gun sh war power gun warships last a significantly longer time um if you've got these uh, automatic rapid firing 3 inch and 6 inch aa guns they can with radar guns actually create a fairly um effective wall of death um around ships um to protect them against anything up to and including the kind of high subsonic speed jets that you'd generally be facing and maneuvering warships are always relatively good at dodging uh, most kinds of bombs from high altitude anyway now obviously guidance systems and then the eventual advent of missile rocket tech now in the sort of late 50s early 60s would still lead to problems um, but i suspect you'd probably see at least another generation maybe two of um, gun warships in, even if they're serving as purely as escorts for the aircraft carriers, attacking warships would actually become quite difficult, I would imagine. And finally for today, Bill Brockman asks, Were the Atlanta and Dido class AA-like cruisers a good idea in retrospect? Did any Didos get used in surface actions like the Atlanta did to her detriment? I think overall they were especially given the time period they were built in, they were probably a good idea. They certainly provided some much-needed anti-aircraft firepower, um, albeit, as, obviously, as it turned out, you could provide this kind of firepower on larger cruiser hulls, but then, well, you you would had one cruiser that had to do the surface action guard duty and the anti-aircraft guard duty, and being the large ship, you would generally keep that for your fleet actions whereas the Atlantas and the Didos could be used in smaller ship actions um, and in smaller formations, and ultimately cost slightly less to build. So given the period, yes, they they were a good idea, I think. Um, the one negative um, for them, I mean, especially for the Atlantas, was that in an effort to make them economical, they were built very close to the margins on in terms of their displacement which gave the atlantis significant problems in upgrading during the war so maybe if the atlantis had been built with another say 500 500 tons on them um that would have lent a lot more uh, versatility to them and with the didos 
they didn't quite have the same built to the limits restrictions, um, but they they did suffer from um, having a relative shortage of 5.25 inch turrets, so <laughs> they maybe could have done that a bit better. Uh, but yeah, overall, an anti-aircraft cruiser was definitely something that was needed, especially in the early part of the war. Um, I say towards the end of the latter part of the war, when the larger cruisers were covered in AA guns and battleships as well, uh, they were perhaps less necessary. But certainly in the early part of the war, they were very definitely a good idea. Um, in terms of the DDoS being used in surface actions, yes, actually they were using quite a lot of surface actions. Surprisingly, the Royal Navy did treat them as very much as a light cruiser's first, anti-aircraft uh, cruiser's second, although they acknowledged obviously they had a good role in that as well. Um, and the Didos saw quite a lot of surface action, um, mostly in the Mediterranean. Uh, they took part in a number of uh, fleet actions, including um, Matapan and various battles of Sirt, uh, where they proved fairly useful. Um, they also were quite useful to send out in raiding operations against various uh, Axis convoys. And um, in that role, they took on convoy ships, escorts, destroyers and light cruisers um, to pretty decent success rates. Uh, the fact that the 5.25 inch gun was a high velocity weapon um, with a long barrel did help in this and the slightly larger shell as well. Um, about the only surface action where they, the Didos ended up losing a ship for um, not a lot gained in return was the Battle of the Sept Isles um, in 1943, I believe it was, um, where HMS Charybdis was leading a unit of destroyers and ran into a group of German destroyers who saw them first. Uh, it was a bit weird. Visually, the Germans saw them first on radar. The British saw the Germans first, but they didn't have visual confirmation because it was um, sunset, so it was the light was very definitely not in their favour. The Germans saw the balance of power was against them, and definitely if they'd engaged in a gunfight, Charybdis would have reaped a very high toll of the German ships. But the Germans did the sensible thing. They turned around and legged it before they could be visually spotted, but dumped a whole ton of torpedoes in the water, two of which hit Charybdis and sent it to the bottom for no loss on the German side. Uh, but that surface action aside, generally speaking, the Didos actually proved to be very capable ships um, in in their various surface actions, say, particularly in the Mediterranean area. And that brings us to the end of the dry dock for this week. Sorry I didn't answer quite as many questions as I usually do. Um, but some of those questions were quite interesting, at least to me, and so I spent a fair bit more time answering them than um, usually gets given to the average dry dot question. I hope you don't mind, and see you again in another video.